I think um, it's important to 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 note, um, at least from my experience, having having worked for some time in Palestinian civil society, that um, I know quite a few uh, Palestinian international lawyers who um, would really object to the idea that international law is no longer helpful um, in 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 resolving um genocide and, and racial discrimination occupation and so on and so forth in fact i think um the people that i've encountered in my work who are the most creative um and the most effective in using international law come from um these situations where you're seeing the most brazen and transparent breaches of international law Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and today I'm talking to two academic colleagues, both of who study neutrality in international law. I've got with me Amela Skilian and Pierce Clancy. Amela is pursuing her PhD on EU arms export controls at the University of Bremen in Germany. She holds an LLM in European and international law and is working with several international peace organizations, among others, the International Association of Lawyers Against Nuclear Arms and the International Peace Bureau. Pierce is an Irish, Re Irish Research Council PhD scholar at the Irish Centre for Human Rights and just finished his PhD thesis on permanent neutrality in international law. Pierce also worked as a legal researcher at Al Haq, a Palestinian human rights organisation based in the occupied West Bank. Both of them were recently at my Neutrality Studies conference here in Kyoto, in person and online, and today we want to look more closely at an often forgotten issue, namely that we still have a law of neutrality and that it applies even as we speak um, about these ongoing armed conflicts in Europe and the Middle East. Amela, Pierce, welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks, Pascal. Well, both of you, you're studying the law of neutrality, which is quite fascinating because it's something that a lot of people don't even know that it exists. Can I maybe ask both of you, starting with Amela, what exactly is that part of international law and is it still relevant today? Oh, two huge questions at the beginning. Um, what is the law of neutrality? I'll start with this one and then is it still relevant? It is an old body of international law which developed in the 18th or 19th century as custom. It was codified as such in 1907 in the Hague Conventions and it continued as treaty law and customary law, especially as customary law, to apply, <laughs> although this is disputed among some scholars. But I would definitely argue that it still applies. It governs the relationship between belligerents on the one side and neutrals, that is states that are not involved in the conflict, states that are not participating in hostilities on the other side. So maybe I'll leave it just here, what, what it is, and Pierce may uh, complement this, and why is it still relevant? Well, <laughs> Uh, we still unfortunately have uh, international armed conflicts or conflicts in general. It wouldn't be relevant if we would stick to the law we have, which outlawed war and outlawed the use of force. But unfortunately we do. And as long as we do, and as long as the U um, Security Council is not efficient enough to fulfill its primary obligation to restore peace and security once it's it breached or threatened, we have to rely on the norms of the law of neutrality. Pierce, do you agree to that? Or would you um, add? Absolutely. Sorry, Pascal. Um, absolutely, I'd agree. Um, I think uh, Amelia is totally right when she says that, you know, as long as the collective security machinery um, that was erected in 1945 in the UN Charter doesn't work, the law of neutrality will continue to be relevant. Um, now, I think it's interesting that this debate as to whether the law of neutrality still exists or whether it plays a role on the international stage anymore has um, sort of been renewed recently. Um, to a certain extent, I, I think it is true that the law of neutrality no longer plays much of a role in terms of the sort of discourse that states uh, put forward. 
Um, it's very, very rare these days to see explicit references being made by states to the law of neutrality or even the concept of neutrality very much at all outside of the permanently neutral states. Um, that said, I don't think that means that the law of neutrality no longer has any bearing on how states sort of orientate themselves or conduct themselves while there's an international armed conflict ongoing. Um, I think if you look at sort of the minutia, particularly since um, the current stage, let's say, of the Russian invasion of Ukraine began in February 2022, um, a lot of the things that states have been doing that they've sort of found a need to justify by um, you know, in potentially quite creative ways, um, they need to justify that because it's contrary to the prior conception of the law of neutrality, let's say. That would be the prohibition of um, neutral states supplying arms to belligerents. Um, many European countries have, have um, taken it upon themselves to supply arms to Ukraine, um, and they need a justification in some way for that. And they would not need a justification for that conduct if the law of neutrality no longer applied or they didn't consider it um, to be important in some way. Um, maybe like a quick note on my own country, um, Ireland isn't a permanently neutral state, but we have traditionally pursued a policy of, quote unquote, um, military neutrality. Very rarely does the Irish government link that explicitly to the law of neutrality, as would be set out in the 1907 Hague Conventions. But there is evidence that those conventions are at the fore of um, certainly my government's thinking when we're orientating ourselves around armed conflicts, even then to the minutia of not sending weapons to Ukraine, but maybe sending defensive material, which based on one reading of those conventions wouldn't necessarily be in contravention of the prohibition of neutral arms transfers. Um, so I think it's still very, very relevant, maybe not in a very um, transparent or explicit way, um, but there is evidence that it's sort of um, still informing the thinking of states, still informing the thinking certainly of legal advisors working for, for government agencies. Yeah, and I think, I mean, there's also an argument that um, on the one hand, the law of neutrality applies immediately as soon as a conflict breaks out, right? And it applies on everybody. But on the other hand, it's also that uh, you can't just wiggle out of it. And yes, you can infringe it, or you can infringe on it, but in theory, um, it applies and actually states behave like that. Because Amela, you also made the point, I, re I recall at the conference that, look, if it didn't apply anymore, why do all of these states put these rules and regulations into their military manuals? Can you maybe explain that a little bit? Right, yeah. Um, I just wanted to um, give one remark to what uh, Pierce said, because this is really important. Um, giving justifications for a rule that... Uh, in the first place prohibits something. So every time, this actually doesn't only apply to the law of neutrality, but it becomes evident as just Pierce explained um, at this example of weapon supplies or other military aid to, the, to Ukraine. Um, every time states try to justify their conduct, they recognize and confirm the rule that is prohibiting this conduct in the first place. And yes, um, regarding the evidence of survival of the law of neutrality, well, there are many. Um, state practice is one of them. Every time the UN Security Council was not able to act or resolve a situation, they just kept relying on the norms of the law of neutrality. If you have a look at the Geneva Conventions, they are full of references to neutral states. So if we just say, well, it doesn't apply, I, I wouldn't know how to interpret those those norms. But um, yeah, let's then be creative after we are all, all of us agree that it, it doesn't matter at all. Um, and Pascal, you mentioned military manuals, which I mentioned at the conference as well. We um, consider them as an expression of opinion juris, that is the belief that they are acting according to law even if those rules are not written, but actually customary law, we are talking about customary law, but they are, or most of them, not all of them. Um, um, it is really interesting to, uh, I would actually welcome the idea of having a comparative study of on uh, military manuals, but uh, as you can imagine, my um, language knowledge is very limited and I can't read in Chinese or, or Hindi or, um, many African languages. So um, I did have a look at Latin American states, of course, everything which is written in English, 
and uh, many European states, and I was searching for French speaking as well. Um, there are military manuals where the law of neutrality has gotten even a whole chapter, very, very detailed. For example, the US one, uh, the one from Germany, then there is New Zealand, Australia, very, very detailed. Um, there is even a commentary to the US military manual written by very prominent two uh, legal scholars. And then there are military manuals where it's not really a complete chapter, but neutrality is there and the law of neutrality which maybe has two or three pages. And then at some point, um, some military manuals do not have a chapter or a dedicated section to it, but they do have the provisions of the law of neutrality. For example, in maritime wartime, um, quite often, which is probably the most important part where the law uh, or the norms of the law of neutrality would be of interest for states. And then there are military manuals such as the one from Argentina, which doesn't even mention neutral states or the law of neutrality at all. But in the annex to applicable law in an armed conflict, it lists the Hague conventions. And the, the argument here is, of course, that this is the official manual of how soldiers have to behave, right? This is how states train their people under arms of what the governing norms and rules of the international community are. Hence, if we still find that, then it means the states didn't give it up, even if nobody talks about it. Um, Pierce, do you want to add to that? Sure. Um, I think you're totally right that neutrality continues to play a role in in military manuals. And um, I suppose another sort of source of opinion yours or the opinions of states that is quite interesting in the context of neutrality is the emerging discussion as to what rules and principles apply in cyberspace and in cyber warfare. Um, so a number of states have taken it upon themselves to issue position papers, sort of outlining their vision as to how international apl law applies in cyberspace. Um, and in a number of those, the law of neutrality is given sort of pride of place, right? Um, because it fills up a gap that would otherwise exist in that body of law. Um, the issue being essentially not all cyber attacks, it's generally agreed, would constitute a use of force, right? Um, similarly, some um, parts of the infrastructure that would be engaged during cyber attacks, during cyber espionage, and so on and so forth, is located in neutral territory. So if they're not covered by the prohibition of the use of force, surely then it would be the law of neutrality that would provide them some sort of legal cover, legal protection. Um, that's the opinion that a number of states have taken. Um, it's also the position that the vast majority of scholars working in this area um, have adopted. So you see the law of neutrality being sort of returned to because it provides a sort of systemic quality to international law. It sort of fills gaps in the application of international law to cyberspace that would exist if the law of neutrality no longer applied. So that's quite a sort of forward looking, ironically enough, uh, approach that states and quite prominent scholars are taking to the law of neutrality, which of course is completely at odds with this sort of narrative that the law of neutrality is no longer applicable. Um, I think we're also quite um, right to point out the importance of maritime um, maritime warfare in the context of the law of neutrality. Um, there's not really much meaningful debate that um, uh, neutral status is no longer engaged in, in during uh, maritime warfare. In fact, the distinction between belligerent and neutral vessels remains extremely important in the maritime space. Um, I think, you know, when we're having these sort of discussions, particularly in the public sphere, I would say, around the law of neutrality, um, largely speaking, it revolves around stuff like neutral arms transfers, um, even, you know, political statements being made, even though the law of neutrality does not govern that. Um, the sort of nuts and bolts, the everyday business of the law of neutrality remains at sea, um, and there's no meaningful um uh, argument being made that it's no longer applicable in that space. So in my opinion, the law of neutrality is, is just as relevant as, as it has been um, since 1945. Yeah. Uh, the, these are very good explanations. And one of the misunderstandings is, of course, that the law of neutrality only applies to states that officially 
uh, declare themselves neutral, but it's not a necessary component, right? It automatically applies to everybody who's not a belligerent. Now, the history of neutrality, especially for those who've read Steve Neff, they realize it's a history of the neutrals basically fighting for their right to trade while the belligerents try to fight against the neutrals to tell them stop trading with my goddamn enemy. And the neutrals always explain that it's your enemy, not my enemy, therefore go screw yourself and I'll, I'll continue trading. And right now we we are witnessing in Europe a classic land war that could have been like straight out of the textbook of, the, of any kind of 19th century uh, uh, European warfare. But if we look forward, sadly, uh, a next flashpoint is definitely in the South and East China Sea and in the um, in the Pacific, uh, where if there is ever an uh, hostilities breaking out either around Taiwan or in, in the Philippines, it would be a maritime war. Um, two colleagues in the global South, especially in ASEAN countries, um, what do you think would be the main problems of like potential neutral powers like Indonesia, like Malaysia, uh, maritime states, uh, when it comes to their rights to continue trading with all sides, while let's say China and the US were at each other's throats? Can you can you can you come up with things that you might might think of? Maybe first uh, Amela and then Pierce. Yeah. Well, well first of all, let me just um. Uh, say that neutrals in general have two main rights and one you already mentioned it this is to continue their free trade or economic relations actually it is peaceful relations with all belligerents whatever the number of <laughs> and the second one is to have their territorial integrity protected so their territory is unviolable and this is what they have to what they can expect from belligerents as long as they respect their rights. Um, we talk about a recipro reciprocal um, effect of the rights and duties of neutrals and belligerents. And there is a um, specific part in maritime warfare and the law of neutrality um, allows a belligerent to search and seize a neutral vessel to search for contraband, to so-called contraband, to items that could be aimed at sustaining the war effort of one of the belligerents. And if the one of the belligerents finds these, it can capture the contraband. Basically. Dual use goods in today's jargon. <laughs> Well, could could be, could be, but it can also just be military aid and what whatever form, which was not um, announced before. Um, humanitarian aid, of course, does not count in this. Uh, we did, we haven't mentioned this yet, but humanitarian aid, even if it's delivered only to one party, to one belligerent, is not a violation of the law of neutrality. But we are talking here about items that would sustain the war effort. And this is something that neutrals have to endure, this search and visit, even if there is no contraband at all at neutral vessels. So this is one of the restrictions they have to live with. And it can be quite unpleasant. And another thing which comes to my mind um, immediately would probably be sanctions um, for trading with one of the belligerents, although they are illegal in this sense because they did not um, violate any of, of um, the norms. They actually do have a right to continue to trade with both belligerents, but I would expect in this constellation uh, sanctions from one of the major powers for it. Pierce, do you want to add something? I think um, Amelia covered kind of, kind of everything that, that... Um, comes to mind. I mean, the fact remains that the law of neutrality and and also to a large extent the law of maritime warfare is is a very very old body of law. Um, and to a certain extent, it's a, it's a bit of a fish out of water. Um, in the modern international legal system, right? Um, and we've seen scenarios since 1907, since 1945. Um, 
where that body, those bodies of law have been tested more or less to their limits, um, not just on their own merits, but also in their interaction to the UN um, with the UN Charter and the collective security um, machinery that's that's set out um, there. Um, search and visit is is an extremely important part of the law of neutrality. Um, but it's interesting that there's certain doctrinal issues around how search and visit works with the prohibition and the use of force that have never really been untangled, right? Um, if we were to see a, a large scale maritime conflict or an, uh, an international armed conflict playing out at sea, it's possible that that would also, that would be sort of a central part of the, the legal issues that would arise there. You know, is exercising the right of search and visit necessarily a use of force, right? And thus prohibited. Um, could it constitute, as James Upshaw argues in his book from 2020, um, do, um, there it is, it's an excellent book, um, but does exercising the right of search and visit necessarily involve a threat of the use of force and thus is unlawful if not conducted in self-defense, right? All of these questions have not really been settled. And if you're looking at a large scale maritime warfare involving one or even two um, global superpowers, you would imagine that these sort of legal contestations would um, come to the fore. Um, if you're looking at a large scale maritime conflict as well, I think the law of blockade poses um, serious issues. Um, now, the law of blockade has not massively been returned to or sort of revised um, since the introduction of the UN Charter. Of course, there have been high profile blockades since then, most prominently the Israeli blockade of the Gaza Strip of Gaza. Um, but the, the sort of legal issues have, I would say, largely um, remained uninterrogated by major state powers, right? Um, what would it look like, for example, if a blockade affected not just the um, affected civilian population, but affected the rights of a powerful, um, in this case, neutral state, right? Um, if China imposes a blockade on an important port for US trading, what would the US have to say about that? And what kind of legal issues would be thrown up there? Um, so all of these issues sort of um, come to mind as potential breaking points for the traditional law of neutrality, um, particularly in how um, those bodies of law interact with the UN Charter. To a certain extent, it's really just a lot of uncertainty um, and, and questions more than answers. One of the things that we see in history time and again is as soon as conflicts break out, then usually you have a whole group of countries that are not part of that conflict primarily, but they all scramble like to find some way of answering the the restrictions that belligerents put on them. Um, and asked in this in this sense, if neutral parties or a party that says I'm not part of this conflict, if they start defending even militarily, some of the rights they believe to have, does that constitute itself a breach of peace? Like um, Amala first and peace, like let's say hypothetically, Indonesia, there's a war between the US and China and the US starts blocking the Malacca Strait or something funny like that in order to choke off uh, oil deliveries to, to China and, and all the deliveries. Would Indonesia have the right to even use military force against such a such such a move by the U.S. if it said this is a breach of my uh, of my uh, neutral rights, maybe Amala first and then Pierce. Yeah, very interesting hypothetical question. Um, generally, neutrals have a duty to defend their neutrality, uh, even by resorting to the use of force. But and then I come again with in general. <laughs> This mostly applies to their territorial neutrality. So when a belligerent tries to violate its, new, its territorial neutrality, meaning it enters neutral territory um, to use it for its war effort, either to launch its attacks for, for, from that uh, position, to use it for other purposes, to make a military base, which is, I think, mo the, the most common thing one would think of then the neutral has definitely the right to use force to expel the belligerent forces and until, only to the extent until the violation of its neutrality is, is terminated. This use of force is not 
seen as a uh, use of force which would trigger the right of self-defense of the belligerent, which was first violating the neutrality. So, and the neutral would not enter the conflict and would not become a conflict party. Whether the use of force could also be used to maintain trade relations, which it has a right to, is a really interesting question. Uh, but as I said, I just came across uh, defending its neutrality in relation to territorial integrity, and I would now first stick to it and say that the aggrieved neutral in this case has the right to countermeasures against the belligerents, which is which is um, violating its neutral rights. <laughs> yeah. Pierce, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I agree. I, I think the most forthcoming um, legal response that the aggrieved neutral would have would be countermeasures. Um, I, I suppose to add to what was said as well, I think it's important to remember, um, again, as I've said a few times, that the law of neutrality was developed prior to um, the prohibition and the use of force, right? So when you look at the 1907 conventions, you actually see, um, as Emila said, uh, there's a duty to um, to repel breaches of neutrality. Um, now, that would not be permitted today where there is not, quote unquote, an armed attack, right? Um, which is the sort of uh, precondition for the exercise of the right of self-defense in the UN Charter. Um, sort of without getting into to too many specifics in terms of a thought experiment, I think, again, the law of blockade and, and to a certain extent, the traditional law of maritime warfare poses really serious questions here, right? If you look at um, the rules that apply in maritime warfare, the, the use in bello, right, the law that applies during hostilities, um, there are actually rights of belligerent states to destroy neutral merchant vessels, right? Um, if they refuse to submit to search and visit um, under the law of maritime warfare, those vessels can be destroyed. Similarly, um, a, a, a neutral vessel can be destroyed if it attempts to run a blockade, right? How that plays out um, in tandem with the prohibition of the use of force and the now um, somewhat circumscribed uh, right of self-defense is not necessarily clear. I think it's doubtful, right, that if a neutral vessel was um, attempting to run a blockade in the modern day, that that would be a, um, that attacking that vessel, potentially, excuse me, destroying that vessel would be a legitimate use of force. I think that would quite straightforwardly be unlawful. And um, whether that interaction would then give rise to the right of self-defense of that neutral vessel and allow them to respond, that's not necessarily clear either, right? So how all of these interactions play out in line with the UN Charter, I think is is actually quite unclear um, and as of yet untested. Now, hopefully it will not become tested. I, I think that would be quite an easy way for things um, in such a hypothetical uh, conflict to escalate quite, quite quickly. Um, but again, I think it goes to show this sort of um, tension between the old law and the new law, right? Um, both of which, ironically enough, have at their core um, restraining conflict, right? Um, two different approaches to the same goal, I suppose. Yeah, although the, uh, the, the approach, the, the UN Charter approach is to outlaw war, make it illegal, mm -hmm. and the, the, law, the, the underlying thought of the law of neutrality is to keep it small, as small as it needs to be in order to then resolve, get resolved. Uh, while not sucking in everybody else. And unfortunately, at the moment, what we are seeing is just the crumbling down of the... Um, I mean, we've never we've never had a moment when we had no warfare. We kind of, funnily enough, we renamed the law in war, the use in Bello, to humanitarian international law, right? We gave it a new name and we, we, uh, we did away with the term war and we replaced it by armed conflict. Uh, so we kind of changed the jargon, but we didn't get rid of the underlying problem. Um, now, this sometimes people say like, oh, this is a purely hypothetical discussions for egghead academics in the real world. Nobody keeps to these laws anyhow. And we know that because they're breached a thousand times over, which is true. Um, but at the same time, 
it doesn't really go away and states are still interested in this and states do uh people do think about it so why do you think maybe now in inverse order like first Pierce and then Amala, um why do you think that despite the fact that all of these international law is being breached time and mm. again it doesn't go away i mean we still talk about it constantly even while watching a genocide in gaza and we still talk about human rights and, and we still try to develop them why is that yeah i i, I suppose half jokingly the most cynical answer is because it provides jobs for for international lawyers and and academics um but i also think there's sort of important normative arguments to be made around the continued relevance of of international particularly um today as it's 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 quite difficult to be optimistic about international law i would say right um first of all i think it provides a common language that we can all use right um there are sort of disagreements and there are arguments um, from various perspectives as to what exactly the Geneva Conventions do, right? What the what the provisions mean. And um, there are hyper uh, technical arguments being made by particularly military lawyers to provide the greatest um, scope of action for for militaries. You see that in Gaza, um, and that's that's problematic. However. Um, international law, the Geneva Conventions, international humanitarian law, the use of Dalam, so on and so forth, do at least provide us a common language um, to have these discussions to push back against um, that kind of abuse, I would say, of international law. And I think that remains quite useful. I think particularly in the last um, 13 months now, you've seen international law and the language of international law permeating sort of public discourse in a way that we've never seen before. I mean, the the live streaming of um, International Court of Justice proceedings, um, the, you know, huge screens being put in city centres and people watching um, quite, you know, technical arguments being made before, um, you know, an international court in The Hague, that was sort of unthinkable um, prior to um, October of last year. However, that sort of um, use of international law as a way that we can all come together and condemn what's taking place in Gaza and now Lebanon, Ukraine as well, of course, um, I think is quite powerful. And it does provide a means that we can interface directly, um, not just with belligerents or, or states like Israel or or um, Russia and condemn them, but also interface with our own states and sort of urge action um, in some way. And I think within the context of Gaza and the South African case being taken against Israel, you are seeing that play out, right? A huge number of states are now intervening um, to make submissions in that case. Um, I don't think that was done out of the goodness of, of, of the hearts of legal advisors or, or government officials or state ministers or heads of state, right? I think the reason that you see that mobilization is because of um, mobilization on the ground, right? Um, and the fact that those um, activists, advocates, um, sort of grassroots movements were able to use a language that states understand that is international law, I think played um, quite an important role there. Um, I also think international law, even though it's it's sort of widely being breached, does, does still provide um, somewhat of an ordering function, right, on the international stage, right? Um, if you're going to invade another country, if you're going to breach the UN Charter, you do still at least need to justify that, or you do still at need at least need to um, to sort of um, stand up for why you know some kind of vision as to why that's permitted, and states will respond to that, right? You saw that in the context of Ukraine, and um, you saw that in uh, when the UN General Assembly adopted its resolution, roundly sort of condemning that. You saw that perhaps to a lesser extent owing to um, the political pressure and the political um, purchase that Israel has, but you also saw those sort of condemnations. Um, around the, the unfolding genocide in Gaza and the in, invasion of Lebanon, right? Um, this is sort of the classic um, sort of who killed Article 2.4 argument, right? Of would things be much, much worse if we did not have um, these rules like Article 2.4 of the UN Charter and the prohibition of the use of force? Um, at that point, you're kind of getting into hypotheticals. Um, you know, would the world be a better place with or without this law? Um it's really difficult to say, um, but I think the fact that 
sort of this body of law, this language, this order and function is there, probably has um, constrained the kind of carnage that we're seeing in places like Ukraine, um, Lebanon and, and, and Gaza to a certain extent. Yeah. Uh, Amela, your reaction? Yeah, I can completely agree with what Pierce said. Um, I would just maybe add a pragmatic stand. Um, and this is actually what Pierce also said. But what would we have if not international law to govern our international relations, be it the law of armed conflict, but also trade, also diplomatic relations. Law is much more than only war. Even when you buy something, it's you're actually making a contract. So it's, it's everywhere and in international law as well. We may not be always aware of it. And just maybe to think from, from the other perspective, if there would be no international law to govern the relations between international states and even sometimes individuals at an international level. What would it be that would govern the situation, that would govern the relationship? It would be power. I mean, international law is misused mostly by powerful states because of their power. But what would be if international law wouldn't be there to limit it? Pierce just said they're at least trying to justify violations of international law. At, at some point, they just have to change their conduct. So maybe without international law, the things that are now happening in Gaza, in Lebanon, in other parts of the world would just be fine because we, we couldn't even have the basis to fight against it because, well, there would be nothing to prohibit it in the first place. So... International law is very flawed and there is room for improvement. We can talk about that for ages, but in theory, it is better than it is implemented. So we need to work on the enforcement as well, not only on the norms that are not perfect per se, but also on the enforcement. But we would clearly be worse off without it. Okay, yeah, this so is like not, this is not, this is subjective as an international lawyer, so... No. If I might add one more thing, if that's okay. Um, I, I, um, I think um, it's important to 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 note, um, at least from my experience, having having worked for some time in Palestinian civil society, that um, I know quite a few uh, Palestinian international lawyers who um, would really object to the idea that international law is no longer helpful um, in 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 resolving um genocide and, and racial discrimination occupation and so on and so forth in fact i think um the people that i've encountered in my work who are the most creative um and the most effective in using international law come from um these situations where you're seeing the most brazen and transparent breaches of international law um i mean the the legal work that's coming out of um Palestinian civil society, Palestinian um, academia, Palestinian practice, and so on, um, really is at, 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 I think, the cutting edge of, of international legal work. Um, I think the um, the case being brought by South Africa um, against Israel before the International Court of Justice is an example of that. I mean, if you have a look at um, sort of their legal advisors, people behind the scenes, all of these names are are on the um, documents issued by the by the ICJ on the website. Um, there's a huge Palestinian contingent there. Um, these are the people who know how to work with this law, who've been subject to its breaches, um, but who who never kind of give up hope. Um, Raji Soriani, who's a, a, a Palestinian lawyer from Gaza, he's he's head of the, the PCHO or Palestine um, Center for Human Rights, um, has this great quote about how you know they don't really have the right to give up on the prospects of justice. Um, they don't have the right to give up on the utility or the possible effect that international law will have. They don't have the right to give up hope, essentially. Um, so I always kind of come back to that when um, when I start to lose hope in, in international law myself. No, you're, you're right about that. And just let's not forget one of the reasons why Israel is so pissed uh, that at, the, at all of those judgments that come from the UN General Assembly, uh, judgments, sorry, at the, the resolutions that come from the UN General Assembly, at the judgments that come from the international, the ICJ, uh, the, the the International Criminal, uh, the, the ICJ, International Criminal uh, Court of Justice. 
Court of Justice, International Court of Justice. Sorry, this is the UN body. The the reason there was this there was this uh, uh, decision also like recently this summer that the uh, occupation, the Palestinian territories that are occupied by Israel are illegal, clearly straightforward illegal, and they will remain illegal. And Israel has to has to uh, get out of those territories as soon as possible, right? And the reason why Israel is so furious about that is because they know that this stands in the way of normalizing the occupation, and in the end, just make it a normal part of the international world and just let Palestine to be forgotten together with other genocided uh, victims of the past that just left the stage, right? I mean, nobody talks any anymore about the rights of the indigenous uh, populations of North America because they're 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 successfully genocided away, but you you can't do that with the Palestinians partially because they they have the at least uh, still the possibility to say like no there's a norm here so there is some force, but if we go again back to this um, the law of neutrality and to the the sad the sad um, <clears throat> possibility that the next 10, 20, 30 years might be violent and that we might see more international uh, conflicts and wars. If you had to advise states that are thinking right now how not to be sucked into this, if you were sitting, let's say, in Jordan, you were an international lawyer in Jordan or you were an international lawyer in, the, <clears throat> in Indonesia, in Malaysia, what would be your advice to states that understand that there is stupidity going on around them, but they would like to somehow remain outside of it? Is Would it make sense for them to invest into uh, trying to rebuild norms of neutrality if they can through international conferences or through legal scholarship? Um, Amela, what would you what would you advise and then Pierce? Yeah, um, I have to say I've never imagined myself <laughs> as a state advisor, <laughs> but um, I'll give it a try. Um, I would definitely advise for it, for um, strengthening uh, the position of neutrals and the law of neutrality, be it in form of conferences, of academic research, uh, whatever make, uh, whatever it takes, definitely, in, in any case. Um, I have sometimes the feeling when I listen and read the discussions going on now that we are coming back to a just war theory. And this is a pre-charter instrument. And this is somehow forgotten. So we have overcome this. We, we, ha we got rid of it because it didn't work at one point. Our aim is to outlaw war as such, be it a just war or a unjust war or whatever would be the opposite. So returning to a just war theory or whatever would be the contemporary supplement for it is not according to the aim of the UN Charter. And I'm not saying that the law of neutrality can fulfill all the aims of the UN Charter. It is there because the UN Charter is not implemented or enforced as we would like it to be. But as long as this is the stage, they have to work side by side Although this may seem like, oh, but the law of neutrality is only a residual mechanism, but still we can make it work and complement the UN Charter and its and its aim to outlaw war as long as we don't fix it or improve it in in the enforcement. So yeah, that would be my advice. Pierce, your advice. Um, it would be extremely difficult advice to give, I I, I think. Um, what the legal advice would be, I'm not so sure. Um, but I suppose the broader advice um, on, on sort of a global scale is that um, ideally we would move towards a point where war and armed conflict is no longer beneficial. Um, particularly, it's no longer profitable. Um, because I think that has been a driving force in the continuation of conflict Um in the past number of decades. Um, if sort of um, the political scientists and the, the security study scholars are correct and we are moving towards um, sort of another sort of Cold War paradigm um, where continued conflict or, or, or proxy wars are um, imminent, I think um, we're moving towards a, an increasingly difficult time. Um, another time where international law will continue to be tested um quite strenuously as as has occurred in the past 
Um, the idea of, you know, what is the legal response to that? Do we need more law? Do we just need enforcement? Um, generally speaking, I think um, it's, it's it's probably the latter. Um, we have a huge amount of international law. Um, the issue is that just during these conflicts, it's not being adhered to. So strengthening the mechanisms out there for enforcement, strengthening the means by which um, states can be held accountable for breaches of international humanitarian law, breaches of uh, the prohibition of the use of force and so on and so forth, international criminal law, all of that's really, really important. Um, the framework is there, right? There's a permanent international criminal court. Um, there are um, fora such as the International General Assembly, Human Rights Council, Security Council, and so on and so forth. All of those have issues, um, but they do provide sort of a space for enforcement or, and for ensuring adherence to international legal standards. Um, increasingly, you're seeing the International Court of Justice as well being um, turned to as almost a human rights court, right? Um, we've talked a lot about South Africa and Israel. I'd also point to um, the case being taken against Syria for widespread and systematic breaches of the Convention Against Torture. Recently, there's been... Um, a um, announcement that there'll be a case brought against Afghanistan for um, quote unquote gender apartheid and, and systemic gender discrimination. I think these are positive developments, um, but they need to, to, to exist across the board if they're going to, to continue. I think it's, it's noteworthy that all of those cases with the exception of the South African case are bring, bringing, uh, being brought by global North states, right? States from the global North. Um, but of course, there are huge issues in the global north as well that this international legal machinery um, needs to respond to. So, you know, more effective use of, of the um, enforcement mechanisms that are there, more of a commitment to international law, to peace and security and so on and so forth, um, broadly speaking, is what we need. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the problem is it's we the enforcement mechanisms don't work as they are supposed to. So the, the question is like, what can states still do on their own and how can they creatively use the tools available under international law, even when the others start breaching uh, basic norms, right? How can, what, what, what can they do in order to entice others to... For instance, not Blake uh, block the Strait of Malacca. For instance, to not do an extended an extend an extended blockade, um, or not to shoot over their territories. I mean, if Iran and Israel want to fire rockets at each other, those have to fly over at least one, if not two, other other states. So the question is, like, if you're Jordan, should you mm -hmm. shoot down any goddamn projectile that flies over your territory and should you try to have that capability right in order to make sure that you are respected as a non-participating uh, uh, state in, in in that conflict and these are things that unfortunately now have to be like seriously pondered about but the more states that wonder that that try to figure them out for themselves the higher the chances to implement something when contingency breaks out maybe as a last statement may i ask both of you uh to to give me your impression of um what would be the most effective way for individual states to to develop their their internal capacity to use international law and the law of neutrality as an as a tool uh, in the future to do their to to remain outside of conflict. Um, for instance, Pierce, uh, you're studying uh, permanent neutral states. Is it a good idea to declare neutrality, like say it outright? Um, does that make a difference? Does it not? Like legally and, and practically, what what would you say? Maybe we start with Pierce and then with Amela. What can a state, a, a concrete state do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think permanent neutrality is one option, right? Um, I would hesitate to say that it would be anything like a panacea, even that it would be appropriate in all circumstances. Um, you know, history is rife with examples of failed permanent neutralities that simply have not been respected, right? Belgium and Luxembourg here in Europe would be the most uh, famous examples. I'd also point to um, Laos, Laos. In, in Southeast Asia. Um, that was a permanent neutrality that was sort of erected by the great powers. Um, 
and then was immediately breached by those same great powers um, and, and sort of um, crumbled accordingly. Um, permanent neutrality can serve to sort of bolster the promise of the UN Charter in certain circumstances, right? Um, essentially by taking that state or that territory sort of off the geopolitical strategic board, right? Um, there's no chance of this state engaging in an international armed conflict or engaging in the use of force against another state. Um, thus, the military advisors can kind of look away from it, or it creates a buffer space. That was the classic example of Switzerland um, following the, the defeat of Na uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, right? Um, but again, as I said, I, I, I struggle to say that it would be a panacea um, for in the vast majority of circumstances for permanent neutrality to succeed, there needs to be quite robust protection for that permanent neutrality. That might just be um, that it's located in a relatively safe area, right? I would say Austria, for example, um, is in a relatively safe area um, where it's sort of permanent neutrality isn't meaningfully under threat. Um, similarly, Costa Rica, um, a state that declared itself permanently neutral in the 1980s, um, even prior to that abolished its military, um, does have issues regarding security and so on and so forth, right? But generally speaking, um, uh, Costa Rican permanent neutrality has, has succeeded in its aim of ensuring that that's not a situation where there are um, armed conflicts or, or there's no meaningful risk of that. Um, however, if great powers, if if real politique and so on and so forth, um, aren't interested in adhering to the terms of permanent neutrality and aren't interested in, in adhering to the rights of that permanently neutral state, um, there needs to be very, very strong protections for that permanent neutrality to continue, right? That was the case in Laos. Um, there have been discussions recently about the prospects of a permanently neutral Ukraine um, you know, I, I don't really have a position on that one way or another. That needs to be um, decided first and foremost, I would say, by Ukraine as an act of self-determination. But Ukrainian permanent neutrality that doesn't have quite robust protections built in to protect against further um, aggression, I think, would probably fail. Um, on a more broad level, and this is the last thing I'd say, um, I think in responding to you know, increased conflict and, and, and the quite violent way the world is going, um, the easy response is always to respond in, in some sort of military way, right? Um, if there are issues around um, your capacity to engage in free trade because of the intervention of belligerents, if there are issues around um, your airspace being used for belligerent purposes, the very easy response is to say that, well, we need to do something um, militarily, right? Our response needs to be military in nature um, to show that we're serious and to show that you can't get away with that when you're you're messing with us, right? Um, this is the classic sort of quite masculine response, right? You know, feminist approaches to international law from a sort of gendered lens. This is the, you know, I'm a big, strong man. I'm going to respond accordingly. That's the classic response. Um, but I, I think Unfortunately, it's quite a dangerous response. Um, you know, more conflict invariably leads to further conflict. Um, and so we need to be quite creative when we're responding to these to these situations. Um, it's not the most popular response. It's not the most attractive response. It doesn't create sort of um, morale and national pride in the way that um, maybe the military response might in the short term. Um, but for the sake of international peace and international security, I think we need to turn to these alternate um, mechanisms to ensure peace. What exactly they are and what the most effective way of, of going about that is, I'm not really sure I'm in a position to, to you know, be the conclusive voice on that. Um, but it's not going to be easy, right? Um, I don't think anyone's under any illusions about that. I'm going to give the microphone to uh, Amela in just a second, but there's a countryman of yours, uh, Bruce Evans, who who worked on the threat of Ireland toward the mm -hmm. UK in the Second World War to cut off Guinness beer from going to the to to uh, British soldiers in case Britain became more bullying. And that was a creative way of of trying to tell the UK back off from my neutrality. 
uh, but of course, like so, such such things only work in 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 very particular situations. But every situation is particular, and every situation might have some creative ways of creating pressure from neutral mm. on unbelli- uh, belligerents. Um, Amela, the last word goes to you. What would your advice be? Yeah, thank you. So. Um... Just building on what you said, we need to look at it on a case by case basis. Case by case basis. <laughs> uh, no, that would be the short version of my answer. Um, maybe first a remark to permanent neutrality, or generally uh, neutrality. I agree with what uh, Pierce said. Um, this can be a good way, but doesn't necessarily have to. At least not in in all cases, as history has shown. And even for states that are not permanently neutral, but just neutral during an international armed conflict, um, credibility is key. And I think this is also what you said, Pascal, I'm quoting you actually here. Thank you. (laughs) Um, I I read it in some of your articles, but I couldn't say which one. Uh, But credibility is key for neutrality to be... um, enforced and respected it doesn't necessarily play out every time and even if it's adhered to very strictly some belligerents may just violate it all the way along uh, without even considering the credibility of it but in many cases it may be fruitful to adhere to it Um, and what else can be done like beyond permanent neutrality or, or or neutrality in an international armed conflict I would be very hesitant to say that the military option is the the biggest and the best solution we have. Um, I wouldn't even say that military alliances are the the answer. The answer has to lie, has to lie in in lay in in the collective security system, which, in my view, is quite the opposite of military alliances. Military alliances are against someone because they are always for a particular group of states whereas the collective security system includes all states even the former aggressor we still will trade with him after or her after the conflict has ended after the security council has resolved the situation so my approach would be rather to strengthen the collective security system which is in their need of improvement but still as an idea we need to strive to it and improve it and then trying to make group of states maybe within the UN Pierce just said it in the general assembly um, in the human security council then we have international courts they are very slow (laughs) and as they are getting more cases they will be slower this is we know this is not perfect and it may take years until we reach or get a final decision about on the cases we just discussed but they are working and we can at least file in states and even that we have now the global south leading in 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 this case not only south africa i mean south africa is leading on it but there are so many states joining and expressing their views So there is a possibility. And then there is the ICC uh, trying to arrest two Western leaders, at least one leader and one is the ex-Minister of Defense by now, I think. So there there are mechanisms on international level. So uh, I would just advise states not to be an individual state and build on their individual strength but to see maybe how they connect regionally with other states and try to enforce their statements within the UN and other international institutions. Group pressure and peer pressure. So, Um, Amela and Piers, thank you very much for your time today. I will link to your articles and to to your work in the the description below. Piers and Amela, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.